grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Wonderful hymns this morning, but you're also very familiar with a hymn that we sing quite often here, especially at funerals, is of course, Abide, Abide With Me. When Abide With Me is played, we sing, Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. And then there's this line in the stanza that gets me every time, change and decay all around I see. Boy, taken by itself, it's rather hopeless. Joys dimmed, glories passed away, change and decay, it's all true. All true. However, Jesus, he confronts this hopelessness that we face and this despair that at times we feel. So let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Within the se uh, first several chapters of Genesis, we come to a genealogy. A genealogy that follows the line through which the Messiah would one day come. The Messiah who would crush the head of the devil and restore humanity back to the way that it was before the fall. A renewed humanity. A true humanity. This line of individuals is referred to as the righteous line of Seth. Because Cain killed his brother Abel. And Seth is the third born son of Adam and Eve. Now this genealogy in Genesis, it spans from Adam to Noah. Taking us right up to the flood. And if you add up all of those years, which is not hard to do, it's 1,656 years. That's a long time. And what one takes note of is the length of their earthly life. You've read it before. I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. It really does boggle our minds. Longevity of life was part of the blessedness of that era. However, what Moses draws our attention to is the fact that they died. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. And you read it over and over. It continues the same way. So and so lived this long, and then he died. And then he died, and he died. Death is a result of the curse. For God told Adam, in the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And they did. They did. However, those who believed in the promised seed, this Messiah to come, they would live again. And so to make this point, right in the middle of this genealogy and all this death is Enoch. Enoch is the seventh from Adam. And he's the great, great grandfather of Noah. Enoch was taken to heaven without dying. The Bible calls it being translated. And this served as a sign to those in the pre-flood world. The translation of Enoch is God proving that he had another life after this. One that was prepared just for his saints in which they would live with God. It was another life better than the present. Life replete with its many misfortunes and evils. Enoch's translation then made death bearable for the patriarchs who lived in this first world, this world before the flood, because they had the hope of a better life after this one. Well, then the flood comes, and what emerges is a second world. And this second world is radically, dramatically, changed from the first, but it is a world that was given the law. And wouldn't you know it, 
God grants the same sign, the same sign to those living and now in this period of time to remind them that there is a better life to come and to instill hope and comfort while living in the present. This time, God translates Elijah. The prophet Elijah, who in our Old Testament text raised the widow's son. Elijah is taken to heaven without dying as his servant Elijah, Elisha, looked on. Now this translation is quite elaborate. It is certainly more dramatic than Enoch's. Enoch just took a walk with the Lord and was not. That's all it really says. He just took a walk like... <laughs> It just took a walk like Grandpa and just uh, didn't come back. But with Elijah, it was different. Elijah involved the Lord picking him up in a chariot of fire and horses of fire. God's natural element is fire. And he picks him up in this chariot. He's called up in a, a whirlwind. It's like God's Uber or something. By the way, when you sing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, that's the longing for divine deliverance. A band of angels coming after me, coming forth to carry me home. That song recalls Elijah's translation to heaven, who never experienced death. So you see, in both ages, the pre-flood world, the post-flood world, God gave proofs regarding the resurrection of the dead. Proof that ultimately the tyranny of death would end. What started in Genesis, and he died, and he died, and he died. It would all come to an end. Proof that the rule of the devil would be destroyed, and proof that there is a better life after this one, all of which is meant to draw our hearts away from this detestable and troubled life and give us Is there still change and decay all around, I see? Oh, yeah. Absolutely there is. But this life is not all there is. There is a better one coming. So you've got the translation of Enoch. You've got the translation of Elijah. But God was not done. Those were just two types. Types pointing to something even greater. Think of them as merely the preview of the coming attraction. And of course, I'm talking about the person of Christ himself, our great deliverer, the promised one in whom both Enoch and Elijah trusted. However, before Jesus ascended into heaven, everywhere he went, he was undoing the effects of death. In the Gospel of Luke, a little girl has died and Jesus takes her hand and says, Child, arise. Death releases her and she gets up at once. In the Gospel of John, Jesus speaks into a dark, dead tomb saying, Lazarus, come forth. Death releases Lazarus and Lazarus walks out. And of course, in today's Gospel account, Jesus says, Young man, I say to you, get up. Death releases him too. For death bows to Christ. And the young man sits up. You know, our words have no authority over death. When we speak to death, we are ignored. We curse at death. Death does not care. We can cry out for our deceased loved ones to wake up! Please, please, please don't die! And we're met with nothing but cold silence. Death has grabbed him. Death has grabbed her. And it will not let them go. Not commanded by us. Almost all of you have walked behind a coffin bearing someone you love, and if you haven't yet, you will. Death shows no mercy. Death shows no pity. It laughs at us as it takes away its victims and we're left with nothing to do but to weep. But with Jesus, things are different. He is the Lord of life. So when Jesus speaks, death reacts. When Jesus speaks, death is forced to give up 
its victims, forced to release them. And just like the wind obeys his word and the waves and the demons and the diseases, death does as well. And death goes home empty handed. When it comes to Jesus being the one that, Eli that Enoch and Elijah point to, Jesus, of course, was not translated like they were. Though Enoch and Elijah never died, Jesus did die. Flesh he took on would be torn. The hand that reached out and touched the bier that the young man was lying upon as the funeral procession made its way to the cemetery in Nain, that hand would be pierced. The sorrow that Jairus and Martha and the widow felt, that would all be Jesus' sorrow. While he restored their broken hearts, his heart would be pierced with a spear, and the deaths that he undid during his ministry on earth would ultimately be his. Jesus died and was buried, and the tomb was sealed all for you, so that your sin so that your curse, so that your death may, may be taken from you and buried with Him. And beloved, if you believe that, it's all yours. All of it. Freely, by grace, through faith in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness is yours. Salvation is yours. Eternal life is yours. So Jesus is not translated. But after his resurrection, he ascends to heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Thus the same Lord that touched the young man's coffin and brought life touches you. And he touches you with the watery finger of holy baptism as his word of promises, or word of promise rather, works life in you. He touches your mouth as his body, his body that, defend, uh, that defeated death and rules heaven, that body is placed into you. He touches your lips as his blood flows from the chalice into you. Life is in the blood, the Bible says. So his life has made your life as your sins are forgiven as you, and as your faith is strengthened. But even all of this, it will one day come to an end. When Christ returns, which he promised to do, all those who have died will hear the voice of Jesus. And when he does, death will then bow to Christ as it always does and release its grip. And should you die before this happens, you will hear his voice and you will rise. And looking back after you stand in a new glorified body under a new heaven and standing on terra firma, a new earth, you will look over your shoulder and you will say, Oh grave, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? Where is it now? Your Christ has defeated it. The grave will no longer be victorious. Death will no longer have a sting because Jesus took that sting of death for you and your grave will be just as empty as Jesus is. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise for prayer.